Welcome to the Cloak and Dagger Podcast. On this podcast, we'll be talking about freeform show Cloak and Dagger. Here are your hosts, Kat and Butch. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cloak and Dagger Podcast. My name is Kat, and I am here, as always, with my ever knowledgeable co host, Butch. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome everyone. In case you guys were like happy about the season two announcement, here's episode nine. You know, yes. here's a, a little bit of grief and tension for everyone. I think they they must have played that very well, didn't they? Because you're absolutely right. We we got we got super excited with our season two announcement, and come on, we all knew it was coming. We were just waiting for Comic Con. So yeah, um, and everybody else knew it was coming too because I think. Uh, it was probably like three seconds after it was announced at Comic Con that um, who was it? It was E News or somebody like that had their tweet and their article already prepared that here, hey, Cloak and Dagger got a season two, so that was already all well planned out. Right, as and the knew, trailer too. Yes, and the trailer too. So as we knew, because the show is so amazing, um, we got season two. So Butch and I will be hanging around a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, You're stuck with us, guys. What did you think of that season two trailer? Now, I know that there are things that you know that I don't know, and I'm trying really hard to not know them, but there's a lot of I know about it. <laughs> I know. Guys, please don't spoil Cat. Like, some people were, like, tweeting at us, and I'm, like, trying to mute people. Like, okay. mute, mute, mute. <laughs> guys, you can, you can tweet at us with spoilers, and but you just have to tell me not to read the... The notifications and I'll stay out of it <laughs> yeah all right so the the I mean I guess you can you can sort of figure out that the next um, season has something to do with mayhem they're not being very subtle about that uh, mayhem is one of the villains of one of the main villains of cloak and dagger um, mayhem is very interesting because Mayhem is like part of uh, Mayhem sort of in between Cloak and Dagger, okay. sort of like an anti-hero. So it's sort of been being in between, like an anti-hero, yeah, being between light and darkness, I guess. So um, Mayhem's like a big counterpoint or, or sort of a balancing, uh, sort of he brings a balancing perspective to Cloak and Dagger, and there are a lot of thematic links to the whole drug thing in the comic books. So I'm very, very curious to see what they're going to do with that because we know what the writers were able to do with um, how, how they fleshed out the Cloak and Dagger. So I'm I'm very interested in seeing what they do with with in season two. Did so, you have yeah. any indication previously that they were going to go this route, or is this something that you just hoped that they would do? Oh yeah. Um, well, Cloak and Dagger from the comic books—they only really have like two or three big villains. Okay. So it was either either go this route or set up another villain who they who maybe they they've already hinted at sort of. Um, so that other villain might also appear in season two because the way they they do it with with these TV shows, I'm sure you you you've seen it before. You, they sort of break up the seasons, right? You have like. Mm-hmm like the first half and the second half and it's sort of the same thing with Cloak and Dagger season one so yeah just because um we have Mayhem coming in for season two that doesn't mean it's only going to be Mayhem so yeah yeah we could still have other characters come on but yeah uh yeah we're, was definitely looking forward to that and uh it's not that big a surprise but still, it's it's going to be something to see, I think. <laughs> well, it's a surprise for me, because as you guys know, I don't know anything about the comics. That's definitely Butch's realm. So I'm kind of walking around like this, with like blinders <laughs> on, when I'm reading tweets and such. Because, and I think I've gotten the gist of what is going to go down, but I'm certainly not going to be saying anything on the pod about it. For those of you who are like me and are part of the MCU and watching because you're part of the MCU but don't necessarily know the background history of Cloak and Dagger. So I'll be pleasantly surprised in Season 2. I'll I'll have my surprise, genuine surprise reactions in Season 2 when things happen. Um, But I'm going to keep it at that. I'm I'm not going to look up and look into this. Nice. 
Yeah, because you know, so that that'll be you, and then I'll I'll be surprised, cat. <laughs> yeah, earmuffs when we talk yeah. about mayhem. Earmuffs for <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, we got we got our announcement that we were all waiting for, and so excited to hear the season two um, announcement. And then last night we got episode nine, and we're just all shook to the core. That that episode yeah. was. I mean, we, we talk week after week about how the writing of this show is amazing, and it just doesn't stop. And honestly, I'm waiting to be, like, I want to be really objective about this show. I don't want to just be like, <laughs> every episode is amazing, and everybody should watch Cloak & Dagger because it's amazing all the time. I do want to feel, like, objectively, like, oh, this episode was good, but it wasn't as good as it could be. But I'm not, right. like, I'm not having those moments when I'm watching. And I think it's it's two reasons, maybe three. It's written so well. Mm -hmm. It's acted so well. And it's Correct. shot so well. They just have like the trifecta Ooh. of the writing, the actors, and the cinematography to put everything together. And that's because they have the Marvel backing. That's right. And uh, it's it's just a good series and Yeah. Well, and but it you know it's not perfect um, no. in the sense that some people like other things and some people like their stories paced in a certain way. They, some people yeah. like their superheroes delivered in a certain way. And this is something that is so unique and yeah, like yeah, like we were talking about last week. The more the more the more it's coming together, the more I'm starting to like acknowledge that you know this might be. And this is in, the, in in a year where Black Panther came out, where Luke Cage season two came out, and Jessica Jones. Like, this might be the most I don't know relevant or important thing that Marvel has put out, which is you know it's it's amazing. It's it's kind you're of shocking to that think about that. Cloak and Dagger. Can you even imagine yeah. believe that you're saying that in this moment? I know, and I, I just <laughs> wish. And it's nobody's fault, but obviously the uh, because of the network and um, actually it's probably mainly because of the network that the, the audience isn't as big as as it should be. I think that and you know the the audience is out there, and we're gonna have because of how short the season is, um, we're gonna have a long hiatus. And I really hope we were talking about this before the show. I hope that a lot of people discover the show. Of, yeah. of course, of the fans, they're, we, you know, they're not a lot of fans compared to other Marvel properties, but they're very, we're very, um, I don't know, talkative, I guess, or passionate yeah. about the, the the show. So I hope that people keep, you know, spreading the word and people discover it. And by the time season two comes out, the, we'll have the, an audience that I keep saying we like we're part of the show, but. Um, there's going to be the, an audience that is like commensurate to the level of of quality yeah. that this show has, you know. Yeah, and they did say that it's going to be back sooner than we think, so that's good. Like in my head, that means maybe spring 2019, maybe. Which is what is that? That would like, be like I don't know, like Aprilish, March. Okay, a little bit sooner than yeah. Like, I don't think I, some people had suggested maybe winter. I don't think it's going to be that soon. I think the soonest we're going to see it is spring two thousand nineteen. I think we'll be lucky to see it then. Um, I think that maybe more realistically, it would be a, another summer release. But I think they are really pushing for a spring. Right, I, I heard they want to grow their fan base. Yeah, and and I heard that they 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 just put together the writers room and they're like just you know starting with the bare bones of uh i believe it's gonna be another 10 episode season which you know sucks but we'll take it um yeah. so it's very early on and i don't i don't know how that goes but last I'm, i was i was trying to figure out um season one they filmed that for five months and then they ended i think around like november maybe um and that came out starting in May. Uh, no, in June. Yeah. But but I think they sat on. I'm not sure why, but they sat on the the episodes for a while. So I think they 
Yeah, so it's very possible that the same thing happens, and then they just release the season as soon as they can. So yeah, hopefully it's, we're not gonna wait like one like ten months for for <laughs> for Cloak and Dagger to come back. Well, we will be here with hiatus episodes, so we will continue to have the pod. Uh, it won't be every week. It'll be every two weeks we'll be releasing episodes, um, but we'll be diving into deeper um, subjects. We're probably going to go into some in-depth character analysis. Um, we do have some right. exciting um, episodes planned with some other podcasts, so we'll look forward to having some guests on. And if you guys have anything that you want us to go into in-depth discussion on, please tweet us, let us know. We'd be happy to include that in a hiatus episode. Yep. All right, ready to, to go into our recap or review of episode nine? Are you okay No, for but this? let's do it. <laughs> let's just let's do it. Do it. Okay, yeah. so episode nine was entitled Backbreaker, and we'll get to what that means in about halfway through the episode. Um, but we start out, and I love this scene, with Auntie, and she's looks like she's stumbling drunk through the streets of New Orleans with no shoes on, and that always gets me because I'm a shoe person and walking outside with bare feet. She, that that got me in that scene, but she's kind of stumbling around, and you can see though that she is purposely stumbling around because she's drawing some voodoo symbols on the ground, and I tried to look those up quickly. I couldn't find any specific reference. I'm assuming that it's some kind of guiding symbol because it, it kept kind of leading her through the city and was maybe giving her uh, general direction and where to go. And we saw right. that the final symbol led her to the Roxxon pipe. And, you know, you look at that and you're like, yeah, we feel you too on that, Auntie. We know that those are no good. Yeah, yeah. They, they um, remember a few episodes ago, like Mina, when she was talking about the, like she, she mentioned there were pressure points all over the city. Yeah. So that's what I thought maybe that was happening. Like somehow um, Auntie was like sensing the various pressure oh, points that that's were. that's a good thought. Because she was marking like a certain amount. And yeah, but but yeah, they could have been leading her towards that, that rock sun pipe that was like made things pretty clear what what, what was happening. Yeah. I like or what, what would happen later. Because yeah. we know what happened later with the pressure, we right. know that the pressure of whatever the gas or, or whatever that is that they're mining for has been building. Um, so that I like that, that she's able to sense the changes in whatever that is. I hope we get a name for whatever that is. Do We, we don't have one yet, right? It's whatever the, the thing is? The yeah, whatever, stuff? like, the substance or whatever. Uh, dark Force works, dark I guess, force, for now. Hair juice, whatever it is. <laughs> It's ancient. Yes. So we've Stinks. got we've got Auntie, and she knows what's going on. So we know that we're going to see her again. But we do skip to Father Delgado, and we got a lot of Father Delgado in this episode, which is exactly what you and I have been waiting for. And they Deserve used it. him. Yes, they used him like he had a great scene with Ty, like no doubt. But the way they used him to frame this episode, right. fantastic. Right. Like really showcase. Like I was like, I want to be in his English class. He's a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so he was talking about, and I'll read some of his speeches coming up because they're they're perfectly um, framing the episode and explaining what we're seeing with the characters. But in this first um, introduction, he's kind of saying, you know, here's our lesson, uh, and Evita is in his class, and you know, he wants to give right. a lesson on what makes a hero, and he's very clearly writing regression on the board. So we're like, we already know that. Well, we already knew we were in for trouble, but now we really know we're in for trouble. So, right. um, you know, he says, what makes a hero? The best heroes, the ones that we love and cherish, they follow an arc. Um, they answer the call, they meet their mentor, they battle, mm -hmm. and they come out stronger. So those are, those are the heroes that we all love. Um, but then he talks about coming to the end of that arc and he uses the reference to tires blowing, that something knocks them down, and they inevitably inevitably become uh, to a point of regression. They lose everything, and they become less than what they were when we met them. And then he says, if a hero is going to be an actual hero, he needs to be born again from nothing. And then right. at that point, you're like, oh. <laughs> do they really have to be born again from nothing? Like, you just want to, like, coddle them because they've come so far. 
And then you hear yeah. it, and you're like, oh, okay, well. And it's funny, because you're like, I know it has to happen. They have to have a fall, yeah. especially after what we saw last week. I mean, they built up, built up, built up, got what they wanted, realized it wasn't really what they wanted or what they thought it was in the last 15 minutes, and now we're kind of left. And What did you think? Glad to see well, so Donato. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of... I, I heard, a, no, not a lot, a few people were like, didn't like that um, all the the all these Father Delgado scenes, um, like mainly for the reason that they felt like there was a little bit too much hand holding going on. Okay. Because because he was literally like the, the, the way they were doing it, right? Like whatever he would say or whatever he was talking about was what would be reflected or would overlap with what would be happening in the lives of of um, Tyrone and Tandy, right, or whoever. And on one hand, that's, that's, that shows how good the writing is because, mm -hmm. like, they, they were, the writers were able to do that. Yeah. But, yeah, for, there's a lot of... The show has established a precedent of, of not doing that, actually, of, of stuff happening. Like what you said, um, was it last week with, with, the, with the, the scuba gear and, and Tandy... Tandy yeah. diving for the, the rig part, which I, I when I watched again, I was like, oh man, how did I miss that? It's so obvious there. <laughs> but but they did not make that ex explicit, and that's sort of a signature of the show. Like stuff happens in between episodes, in between scenes, and for for this to happen, for 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 Father Delgado to tell you what's happening. So a lot of people were not into that. I understand that perspective, definitely. Yeah. It's a little bit um, different, I guess. But at the same time, <laughs> um, you know, any reason to get Father Delgado into the screen is pretty cool because he's a, a very interesting character. And what he was talking about was, you know, the the hero's journey um, trope thing that I think mo a lot of us have heard of, but uh, certainly in my case, I've never really looked at in depth. Um, until this episode, actually, so I, I finally like Googled it. I'm like, what? The, what is that? Like, all I know about mm -hmm. the hero's journey is like, Luke Skywalker went through it. Right. That, that's pretty much all I know. Um, so what we're talking about here is actually somewhat somewhere in the middle of the hero's journey arc, I guess. The hero's arc. Yeah. When when the hero has you know like like I'm just gonna repeat what Father Delgado said, but after he the hero go, goes off and you know, goes into the the strange unknown world. Usually they go through, they fight, and they, they have, like, um, trials and tribulations, and they go through something, like, the, the dark time before the, the light, you know? So we're obviously at episode 9. Things are going to get pretty bad for our heroes because they have to be remade and reborn to, to, to you know, to be, to be, to, to change, I guess. So we're towards the end of the their story arcs. So, yeah. That's it. Maybe that's why they wanted to really, I don't know, hit it home, that, that they were in this regression. And I think that, I, I mean, again, I, I can completely see that, that side of the story. I'm on the other side where I really like the way that they framed it, especially given his position as a teacher. I mean, it made sense for him to have that class. And I thought it was right. really cool to make sure... You know, to, to, to use that literary um, device to show us, you know, we're going through the plot. And I think that it was really setting up for the season finale because that's usually what episode nine is, is like a big setup for the finale. Yeah. Um, also to make sure everybody's on the same page because maybe they, they knew that there was some complexity to their previous episodes that they wanted to just make sure everybody knew what was going on. Again, leading up into episode 10. Right. Um, but again, I mean, I just really like seeing him on screen as well. So maybe that that's a selfish <laughs> thing to, to say. Um, but it, I don't think it was so out of context. It wasn't like he was just some like overarching narrative. Like he, he was in a classroom and Evita was listening to him in a classroom. So I, I think that, that they, when they made the decision to do it, it was a, a well, they, they did it well. You know, it wasn't like kind of like having that, that, that God voice in the background. Yeah. You know, yeah. they brought it into the story. Definitely wasn't, wasn't indulgent or anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
So in while Father Delgado is starting his his lesson on hero regression, we see that Tandy is burning pictures of her family, um, starting with her dad's face, <laughs> and um, she's going to you know she's grabbing her drugs and she's grabbing the cash out of the statue. So we can already tell that you know Tandy has definitely fallen and that she's regressed into her previous behavior. Right. Right. Um, then we get a snippet of the Officer Fuchs investigation, RIP, and O'Reilly <laughs> is in the house, and I kind of thought it was weird she was there since she was the one who found the body. You would think that even though she was an officer, they would definitely like want to keep her out, and in, yeah. in that in that time like be questioning her in some way. Um, but she ends up being the person who finds the murder weapon when she sees the the bloody umbrella near the front door and she pulls it out from underneath the couch and at that point you know before we got more information to me it just looked like some kind of bloody bat yeah that's what i thought too yeah and that's what i wrote down that it was a bloody bat and then i went back and wrote down what it really was or what the symbolization of that was when we find out later um but then they finally kick her out of the scene. So, like, at least she put the crime scene glove on and everything. But she was actually the one who found <laughs> she found the body and the murder weapon. So, um, I don't know if they're going to hold that against her in any way. But we have that. Um, the next scene that we jump into are the Johnsons. So, we have Otis and Adina and Ty. So, the whole Johnson family are at the police station. We're, yeah, we're fast-forwarding eight years. So, we had already seen this scene with the parents and little Ty. Um, and the police captain, and now we have the parents and older tie and a female police captain telling them, hey, we have some new evidence, we're looking at Detective Connors for this investigation. And Ty is standing there looking at his parents, basically like, why aren't you reacting to this? Why are you not showing any emotion? Like, hey, I was right. And when they get outside of the police station, he's, you know, he's basically telling them that, like, I'm right, like, give me some recognition, look at everything that I went through to basically clear my brother's name, but to, to give him some justice, and his parents are kind of like, you know, we're not, we don't want to hear it, we're not having it, and that was frustrating to Ty in that moment. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, the scene at the end of the episode with Ty and Adina is, like, one of my favorites that really goes into depth of why they're having no emotion, but I don't think at this point I really understood why they were so reserved about it did you not nah, mm, i don't know like i just chalked it up to you know old wounds being forced to right reopen because you had, had to deal with that again but yeah for for especially for ty like at the end of the last episode we thought he got it he got he got the win right he got the yeah. win and in this episode, when they were in the in when in, in that scene, like I was like looking at at uh, Aubrey and how he was playing it, and like you can see, like Ty wanted to smile, like he wanted, he was waiting for everyone to like, you know, yeah. be happy and like, yeah, we got him. But like you were right, just, you know, we we didn't yeah. believe you before, but now we believe you. Yes, and he he specifically mentioned that in an earlier episode when he's like, "My parents don't trust me," yeah, and you know that's his big burden on top of what happened to to Billy, his parents, and uh, and yeah, and and Gloria Gloria's acting here. Oh my God! Like, yeah, I could not stop looking at her face. Like, uh, just she was like, like you could tell like so many things were happening underneath her 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 her. Um, her visage, I guess, that that she was like staring off a little bit, like she was deep in thought, and and I I also like the way um the the way the Miles was playing Otis, where he was sort yeah. of in between the two characters, yeah, uh, emotionally where they were, um, yeah, but yeah, the, this scene for me was like so heartbreaking, and you know, on top of every, everything that would go on later, but. Yeah, so you didn't quite get the reason why, but the feels were there, were, right? Yeah, the feelings were there, and you understood, and I did the same thing. I chalked it up to they really just wanted to put this behind them, and I think that right. that was kind of, like, the theme throughout the episode of, like, can't you just put this behind you? Um, yeah. 
But we didn't really, now that you're pointing that out, in the last episode, you know, we definitely saw Tandy's breaking point, but we didn't necessarily see Ty's breaking point because he got, you know, they got the video, everything yeah. was good as far as he knew. You know, we saw that Detective Fuchs died, but he, Ty didn't know that. Um, so yeah. in his mind, it, he was still like waiting for his moment of, of, of justice, of vindication for his brother. And now in the beginning of this episode, we're seeing that that is just not going to come for him in the way that he thought it was going to. Right. So we're, we're seeing Ty's breaking point um, as we saw Tandy's at the end of the last episode. Uh -huh. So then we jump into a scene um, with poor Evita <laughs> waiting at home. Uh, worried sick over Auntie because she hasn't come home and she can't get a hold of her. <laughs> and Auntie stumbles in and, you know, Evita yells at her like uh, a mother would to a daughter, which I thought was really cute. But Auntie says, there is nothing in all the worlds that will destroy us like we will. And I thought that was such a good line because how true is it? <laughs> yeah, it's like she, she she knows what's up. And she, she even specifically mentioned um, Roxanne, right? And yeah. As far as I know, like they, it's not like she had anything to do with the the Roxon part of the the plot until this moment. So yeah, just another hint that for whatever reason she knows she knows that things are 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 about to go down, and she knows specific mm -hmm. some specific information about it. And I'm right. assuming Evita would too. Like she'd tell Evita at some point. Yeah. So you know she sees. She keeps saying there's a crisis coming, it's close, and we're just bringing it closer. And she talks about how Roxanne is digging. She said something like, they're digging and trying to uncover what makes the city special. Something along that line. Um, but she said, you know, they're setting the gears in motion, like, years uh, fast forward. Yeah. Um, and then she says to Evita, like, we can't stop it, but they can. And you know that she's then, and she does say the divine pairing, but you know who she's talking about when she says they. And, you know, they're kind of like, but he doesn't know who his pairing is. And, it, it, you know, Auntie's like, well, does he? You need to ask him. And in that moment, you're like, yeah, Evita, how come you haven't asked him <laughs> about any of this? Like, I don't think we saw her at all last episode, and maybe sparingly in the episode beforehand. Um, but okay. she was like, yeah, I am going to ask him. So then we're moving forward and we see Tandy. And again, she's back at it, just like we knew she would be. Um, but cool reference to the Stan Lee pick. What did you think about that? I liked that touch. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, it, it, what's it called? This, uh, Joe Pokaski called it, uh, Stanley Warhol. <laughs> yeah, well, and, that's, that's good, yes. <laughs> one of his appearances earlier. And it's great because, uh, like, I, I thought the, the Stan Man plate uh, was the, the Stanley cameo that we were going to get, which was fun, but that, you know, it's certainly different from seeing Stan's actual face on yeah. the on the wall. And it's it's different from the other, from his other appearances, which, you know, which, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I really liked that reference they threw in there. Um so most importantly in this scene, we're not just seeing Tandy back at what she knows how to do, but she's better at doing it because she knows that she has this power and she has control over things. So, you know, she is conning this guy and she drugged him and she's telling him, hey, I can see hopes. And she touches him yeah. and she goes into his hopes and he has a hopes of having a threesome with two women and they climb into <laughs> bed with him and, and she tells him, like, you know, I can see your hopes and now they're introducing the fact that she can not only see them, but she can steal them. Is this a common yeah. thing? Or is this new? This is new, but it's very consistent with the fact that Tandy is a thief, right? So yeah, exactly. She's, she's, she's moving on to stealing. And this goes into um, something that Father Delgado mentioned, that they're, they're, our heroes aren't just where they... Like he said, something like they're not just where they were; they're like worse off than when we first met them. Yeah. And yeah, that that goes into what you just said. Like she's not just back to what she used to do; she's better at it, or or she's she's a worse character. Yeah, she's better at she's being bad. Doing, <laughs> yeah, she's doing something really mean, and and we see we see what she she did. She's like, it's interesting because she what she did to him is sort of like what Cloak does in the comic book, so they switch that a little bit. Like okay. she's she's a light vampire sort of. Yeah. Like she gets she gets their hope and their 
optimism and their energy and puts them into herself, takes it for herself, I guess. And the, that's the ultimate drug, isn't it? You know, she and when she grabbed the drug, right. I thought she was going to do them right away, but she was really just yeah. packing them up to use them on her con. And then when right. she took the hope, I mean, you could see what that did to her. It it, yeah. it gave her that euphoria, that it gave her, her that it. hope, it let her have other people's happiness. And that's right. like everything that she was looking for when she was doing pills. So this yeah. is like her ultimate drug where she doesn't even have to spend any money or anything. She can just do it. And it, it's the probably the, the most ultimate high for her. But what is that doing to the other person? So we didn't really see too clearly with this guy because he was drugged. But we can see later on as she continues to do it that it definitely has an effect on the person that she's doing it to. Right. It's, and, then, and it's inter it's just cool that, to see, again, they, they kind of downplayed, downplayed the, the drug um, aspects of, of the comic books, but once in a while it comes up to the surface, and whenever yeah. that happens, you know, I'm like, yay, go comics. Yeah, exactly. We got that a little bit here. Yeah, and you know, she's her emotional pain is, is ten times what it was when she was doing this before. So yeah, she has to search for, sure. for that, that even higher high, because she has to cover yeah. what she's feeling. And right. it's just so sad to see because we've seen her come so far. It's funny because I, I have a friend visiting now and she's never seen it. And I was like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> Let me throw Hulu on. And we watched the first episode. And I'm watching the first episode again and I'm just like, babies. They're babies. I mean, even <laughs> in, in the time that we've seen them, their characters have grown so much. So then yeah. when you get to this point and you do see this regression, it's just even more painful because you just know, you know what they can be and you know what they can have and you just hate to see them like this. That's true. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that, like where Tandy was even um, toward like episode seven, Tandy and Tyrone, just compared to where they were at the start. It's, it's so different. Yeah. And yeah. They've grown so much and then, you know, they have this. Um, so after that scene, we go into another Father Delgado um, classroom scene. So in this mm -hmm. scene, I'm going to read out what he, he said here because it it's, really, it's really impactful. Um, so he says, Hero's regression often begins with a trauma. One that is mm -hmm. some manner a result of their actions, an unintended consequence of their newfound abilities, mm -hmm. the death of a loved one. So we see the death of the loved one with Ty. Where did I leave off here? An uncovered truth. So we're seeing the, the uncovered truth with Nathan Bowen and what Tan right. is learning about her dad. Or a dream that once realized reveals itself as a nightmare. And I think this right. part of what Father Delgado was saying can be really interpreted in two ways. And I think that it can be both Ty and Tandy realizing their mm -hmm. dreams... You know, they they think they got what they want, but it really isn't. Right. But I also think it's a reference to Detective O'Reilly. How she fought really hard. She wanted to take Connors down. Ah, okay. But it ended up being, a, especially for her, a complete nightmare. And not at all what right. she wanted. So I think that the line was also referencing Detective O'Reilly as, like, the secondary hero that we're looking at here. Uh, that's interesting, because what... That's totally, that's correct. Cause I, when I heard that, because I was like, you know, cross-checking with our, yeah. our characters, like you, you know, like you were doing, for me, like, Death of a Loved One was was O'Reilly because of um, Officer Pancakes. Yes. And okay. the dream that reveals as a night, I mean, because everybody, all of the characters experienced death, right? True. But for her, that was like the, she had the recent one, I guess. Yeah. Which is why I assigned that to her. And then, yeah, the dream that reveals as a nightmare, I totally associate that with, with Ty. But you're right, that's true, because um, O'Reilly had a goal in, in the same way that Ty did. Actually, they had the same goal, I guess. And it, it definitely turned into a nightmare for, for both of them, but yeah. immediately for her, I guess, because she, she got stuff later on in this episode. So and that's those, interesting. It, it works. It, it applies in, in different yeah, ways. Those were my immediate thoughts. But, you know, now, like you said, I think they apply to all three of them, all of them. Death of a loved one, they've all had the death of a loved one. Right. Uncovered truth, they've all uncovered truth. Something, yes. And then the, the dream that once 
realized is is actually a nightmare. They've all had that. Yeah. Yeah. Check, check, check. Father Delgado's got us. So then he continues. <laughs> that trauma shocks our hero and ushers in some fears and insecurities that held them back before the journey began. But mm -hmm. those fears and insecurities that haunt them, they're amplified, and our hero, now more powerful, can use that power to tear their own life apart, as we're seeing with Tandy. When right. everything is taken away, what's left? And I think that that, that was such a powerful line, because exactly, when you're taking everything away from these guys who've been so hurt, what do they do now? And as he's going through this lecture, we see a couple of really important scenes. Um, so we see, we see, we're looking at Ty, and he's just got this blank look on his face. He's got a sullen demeanor. He's just, yeah. he's pretty much at the bottom of the barrel, you know, realizing that he got what he wanted and it wasn't what he wanted. So Evita's trying to go to Ty, but he doesn't want to talk to her. Um, and then we're, we also see Adina, and she yeah. can work and she's holding a memo, and that memo said, Roxanne Gulf to address the commencement of new drilling project. And we know that she works for Roxanne Gulf. Right. So that, that section of Roxanne, that's where she works. And the, the memo said it was approved for distribution, so it was telling everybody that we're doing this new drilling project. And you can see that she's angry about it, and I'm not I'm not 100% sure why she was so angry, except that maybe she was like feeling all of her feelings about Billy and the rig explosion, and but she was yelling at that employee. Yeah, that poor guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then of course Ty is walking down the hallway, and that that teammate who's been being a jerk to him bumps into him again, and he kind of is that that mm -hmm. is the same guy, right? The, the yeah. I mean. Annoying face. And we saw a couple of yes, we saw a couple episodes ago that that happened, and Ty kind of just brushed it off. But um, he certainly didn't now because he grabbed that guy and he, uh, for lack of a better term, just beat the shit out of him. I mean, he was really beating him. Yeah, he tore into him. I I almost wish because the way they played it was, music was playing, I believe, so you couldn't really hear. But I, I'd be curious to hear the audio of of that scene, like how hard Aubrey was like actually going, because he looked yeah. legit to stop. <laughs> yeah, he was. He looked le like you're, like you said, like legit, like he was fighting this guy, like he was punching him that hard. And yeah. He, wasn't, he was not. He was definitely not holding back. I mean, he was punching him in the face. He's really good in those scenes. Like yeah. That, when when because like it's the same thing with with, with um with Tandy regressing. Ty's regressing too to what he was. At the start of the season, which is, you know, emotions like building up and then exploding when people set him off. And he, he it's the same thing that happened in episode one when he got into a fight. Game. He got into a fight here. Yeah. But look how much better he is at fighting now. <laughs> you know, talking about <laughs> no, the hero, they can't go back, they have all their new abilities. He's got his new ability to beat the crap out of people. So <laughs> he certainly used that in this scene. Yeah. Um, interspersed in there, so you know, Ty gets pulled away, and then you're like, okay, he's in trouble now. Um, then we go to Tandy, and um, oh, at the end of the last Tandy scene where she was stuck in her euphoria of sealing the hope, Mina had called her, and Tandy ignored the call. Right. Um, but now we see yeah. Tandy going to Mina's, um, mm -hmm. and her dad, Ivan, is there, and he can't walk yet, he's using a walker. But he's there, and Tandy's there to have brunch with them. So we have that established, and, and Tandy, you know, Mina's kind of like, are you okay? You look sick. And she's just kind of walking around, like, in this stupor, you know, kind of like Ty, but in a different way. But you can definitely tell that something's wrong with both of them. So then Ty gets taken to Father Delgado's office. And, you know, Father Delgado is asking him, why are you here? And Ty is basically like, you know what I did. And he's like, but, but you know, trying to get trying to get more into, you know, why why are you here? Why is this happening? And he makes Ty hold those books. And did you <laughs> see the tweets about, you know, Aubrey was saying those books were actually really heavy and I had to hold them for a long time. <laughs> those are in props. Yes. So he's holding the books, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's, um, you know, telling Ty, he's comparing Ty's plates to the War of 1812. 
and he's trying to say, you know, like, when did the war end? And Ty is telling him, and, um, you know, he's joking, like, are you kidding me? I'm in your history class. I know about the War of 1812. But they're comparing it because the war ended, but people didn't really know the war ended, so they were still fighting. And, right. you know, they didn't know it was okay to stop fighting, and that, that was kind of what Father Delgado was trying to get at with Ty, like, you know, the, the war ended eight years ago when Billy died and the police cover, you know, the police buried it. It's, and I don't know how much Father Delgado knows about that entire situation, but, you know, basically saying the war ended, but you keep fighting, you know, when are you going to stop fighting? When are you going to get the memo that the war is over? Yeah. Do you, do you think he's reading the situation right? Because I feel like Ty would, would totally um, be done with his fight, but, you know, his parents were obviously still, still hung up on things, and which, which caused him to to still get hung up on, on the whole thing. But I don't know. Like I feel like, he, that's the thing. Like he can't move on, but he he wants to. I think like he he just can't because of other factors. And I think that he explains it really well later. But you do have that that sense that he is a justice fighter, and all he wants is for everybody to know that, you know, Billy didn't die because he was a drug dealer and he got shot by, you know, or he didn't, they covered that whole thing up, but they're saying that, you know, he died of drugs and he wanted that cleared, like, no, this officer killed him, I saw it, and he wanted some kind of vindication for his brother, whom he loved so much, who treated him so perfectly. So they wanted, you know, he wanted that for him, and I think that in his mind, the cops shutting him down and nobody believing him was nothing that was ever going to stop him because of the kind of person he is. So I think that in that sense... No, that's right. I think yeah. Father Delgado read it right. He just didn't have all of the information. Right, So right. then that makes you wonder, yeah. like, whose side would he be on then? If And maybe he does have all the information, but he understands, like, you can't fight when there's police corruption. There's It's too hard to fight. So I don't know if he would, like... If he's if he has that information and he's still telling Ty just like his parents are, give it up, it's over. Or if he doesn't have that information, if he did have it, would he change his mind? Right. You know, would no, he that's, help him? That's a really good point. That that what we it foreshadows what we'll talk about later. I guess when we know more about the character of Ty, that he even regard, regardless of what happens with his own personal thing, like he's gonna keep fighting for. For I, I don't know for justice I guess or for right. for other people yeah right I mean that that is like a huge part of his character and he's just not true not ready to give it up yet so much so that he's ready to hold those books for as long as he needs it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Father Delgado kind of leaves him there and he's like when you're ready to talk to me I'll come back and you don't have to hold those books anymore um, but then we're taken back into the scene with Tandy and the Hesses and they're eating and Tandy's kind of just picking at her plate and. Ivan starts talking about Nathan, and that's nothing that, you know, she wants to talk about, obviously, because she oh, has no. new information that nobody else knows, and, you know, yeah. Ivan is still trying to remember everything from the past. He's still kind of getting his memories back, but he knows that Nathan was his best friend, and now his his best friend, who was so amazing, is not there anymore, and, and Tandy just doesn't want to hear it. Um, right. So she kind of leaves and goes into the kitchen, and Mina follows her and is apologizing. But then, strangely, says, you know, I'm, I, I have you here because I have an ulterior motive. I want to offer you a job at Roxxon. What do you think? And I think Tandy was just so stunned in that moment. She really didn't know what to do. And I don't know. I kind of felt the same way. But maybe Tandy, in her right mind, would have thought, like, here's another opportunity I can get back at Roxxon. But in that moment, she was just kind of lost. Yeah, it's definitely lost. I, I I feel like it's sort of that thing where, like, re redemption or, or her best life was, like, right there for her to, yeah. to take because um, Ali, Ali, uh, Ali, um, Mina was, like, offering it to her and she was saying, like, yeah, we'll do this for our fathers, for our legacies. Yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll fix everything. And, we you know, we need, Mina's a good person. And if Tandy took her up on the offer, and I, obviously she, she, she'd definitely be unmanable to it, like in episode seven or just a few episodes ago, yeah. that that would have been exactly what, 
that would have been her happily ever after almost, right? Like, yeah, you're right. Like, I would have carried on my dad's work, and you're right. It was kind of like an alternate ending, like a, we can end this. Yeah, forever. what if? Yeah. What if I didn't know that about my dad? This is what I would Yeah. And then boom. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, Mina is offering her a handshake, and I, I still didn't even connect it in the moment, like, oh my god, don't let Tandy <laughs> touch you. But I thought that when Tandy was reaching out her hand, that all I was thinking of is like, oh my god, she's going to accept the job. Like, maybe this will help her get back on track in some way. Um, but obviously when she touched her, that's where the powers came into play. And um, you're taken into Mina's mind. And right. you're, she's in this beautiful Ugh. flower garden full of all of the, these beautiful roses and everything's great. And it's a beautiful world. And then Tandy, and I was mad at her in this because, you know, we just oh, yeah. Mina so much. I was like, don't hurt her. <laughs> I know. But, I know. Like, you really hurt her. Like, she really went for it. So she took her, stole her happiness. And then not only did she do that, but she says to her, now you know how it feels. Like, just shove it home after yeah. that. And then you see, like, you know, like we said, you couldn't see before with the person who was, you know, drugged up, but you can clearly see with Mina that she was very affected by what Tandy had done to her. She stole that happiness yeah. from her, and she was so affected right. that when she saw that B, she killed it. B Arthur. I, I just to hurt myself. I like to think it's the same B that I know. <laughs> that uh, that they let fly away a few episodes ago. Um, it's very, it's very telling. Of course, it's symbolic because. That's the scene where Tandy finally like took control of her, her responsibility over her power and said, yeah. "No, I'm not going to abuse my power." And you know, she just slips into it and does it very casually here, and yeah. it's so sad. And yeah, I hate the. I mean, obviously the writers wrote the scene, but I I I did kind of get pissed off at Tandy. I'm like, "Don't hurt Mina." Mina's like, and we see it because of, of the the hope scene that that's all Mina wants, and it's so corny. <laughs> That's what she wants. Just, uh, she just wants to just save the environment. In beautiful flower yeah. garden full of bees. That's all she wants. Yeah, and and I just I just I love the the acting of Olivia here because I I was kind of like scared of of Tandy like yeah, the way the look she was you? giving. <laughs> yeah, it's like it made me nervous a little bit, and it's so different from from the, you know what she usually portrays. So yeah, because she was not only like. Not just the thief and the connors, but she was vindictive. She was like, I want you to feel what I'm feeling. And I was, like you said, I was mad at her because don't do that to Mina. The yeah. person who, like, I'm sorry that she has the life that that you want. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, she doesn't, like, it's it's so sad because, like, she has, Mina has no clue. Like, maybe if Tandy would have opened up to her and been like, I just found out all this stuff about my dad that nobody knew, like, I don't know, but Tandy doesn't have any friends is the problem, so she doesn't know how to have that social interaction. And and Mina and Ty are like the closest thing she has to, to people who actually realize who she is on the inside, and then she just goes and destroys right. Mina's hope literally and makes her kill a bee. And <laughs> cool, God. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Tandy's locked in her downward spiral very clearly. Yeah. Um... So then in the next scene, we're taken back into the classroom with Father Delgado. And he starts with, It's important to know that regression is a trick. Just like most aspects of the story, our heroes can never actually regress. They can never be who they used to be. So that's where that, that line comes in and we see that. They can't, um, you know, they can never be who they used to be. That person is gone. That person is dead forever and they're never coming back. And our heroes, they just can't hit the reset button. They cannot undo the most traumatic events of their life. And in that scene, we're, we're seeing O'Reilly, and she's sitting in a bar, mm -hmm. and she's getting really, really drunk. <laughs> and with the Irish music playing. Yeah, just to, that was good. Just to hammer it home. <laughs> just to throw that in there. During Mardi Gras. Because that was going on in the background. Did you notice that it was Mardi Gras? Right, I, I saw that. I was like, is it Mardi Gras? Because they didn't make... A big deal out of it, right? Really like, there wasn't it a big. Kind of like through it okay. very subtly. 
you could see like, okay. the decorations at school, and then you yeah. could see some of the party goers when the, uh, later right. on when they were getting arrested, and yeah. So it was just like very subtle hint, like things are really building up, and it's Mardi Gras. So there's a mm. whole bunch of people here. Um, so we see O'Reilly getting drunk in the bar, and then Father Delgado continues, but many heroes find themselves trying to do exactly that, and they dive back into the very life they tried so desperately to escape. Whatever it takes to stop the pain, whatever they can do to quell their regret. This is a desperate play to try to make everything how it used to be. And that's exactly what Tandy is doing. And you right. can see her, and she's at the police station, and she had she had gone back to the church and grabbed a bunch of cash again, and then she's sitting at the police station, and you know exactly what she's doing at the police station. She's finally going to bail out poor Liam. Yeah, poor Liam. <laughs> that's his name, poor yeah, Liam. poor Liam. Did you notice um, when she was sitting at the police station that she looked out the window and that water lady was there? Yeah, <laughs> still delivering water. Still delivering water, <laughs> still stalking Tandy to see what's going on. That made me very uneasy when I saw water lady at the police station. Yeah, true. Um, so, I really... Re okay, remember in, in the way beginning before the show started and we saw Liam's picture and we were like, we don't like Liam, it's bad news. We don't like anything about him. Yeah. And now yep. I just feel bad. I, I feel bad for Liam. Completely. He just is he just gets used over and over again until he kind of puts a stop to it. But she pulls him out of jail and he's kinda right. like, Oh hey. And I don't know how long I don't know what the time lapse is here. I don't know how long he's been sitting in jail, but I thought he looks pretty good for just getting out of jail. So we see Liam with Tandy, and he's kind of like, hey, thought you skipped town on me, and I thought you just were going to leave me here. And then I heard that you didn't skip town, and I was kind of waiting for you to come and get me, and you didn't. <laughs> so, you know, he's kind of like, what are you doing here now? And she plays it off so well. She's like, oh, no, I I just took, I took <laughs> me a long time to get the cash together to come and bail you out. And you're like, mm -hmm. that's good, Tandy. You know he's going to leave you because he's a fucker. <laughs> Um, so she, he, t he says, you know, I thought you moved on. And she tells him that she's actually moved backwards. So I thought that that was an interesting um, line for Tandy. Are you happy to see Liam again? Yeah, I, I did not think that he'd still be in prison because last time I saw him, he was talking about making some kind of deal with uh, yeah. Detective O'Reilly a few yeah. episode, episodes ago. So I thought he'd be, when we'd see him next, he'd be like, vindictive and out hunting for for tandy for payback but she certainly didn't liked follow it. through on that so he was still he was definitely still in jail poor liam see everybody's using him <laughs> yeah yeah so it's interesting that that um yeah i just found myself like really watching the two of them play off each other because we know we know tandy's acting here right mm -hmm. like she's she's playing the part of the victim but I'm, I'm at this point. I'm not sure about Liam. Like mm -hmm. last time we we saw him, he's he obviously pissed off at at um, at Tandy. But we we know he he loves her. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's like he's a con man too. Um, so he knows maybe he knows his guard his guard is up. But then maybe it's not because it's Tandy. So right. trying to figure out like what he's trying to 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 show here. Right. And and I think you're right. Like I think with anybody else Yeah. It would be there would be a guard up. But it's Tandy. Right. So he has that, you know, that soft spot for her. Mm hmm And just like we all do. <laughs> Poor Liam. Um, so then we're back. <laughs> Actually she says to him, I wanna show you something. So then we kinda get into scenes that are, are cut together. Um, so we'll we'll look at these scenes um you know, as they were as they were played out, but kind of mixed them together as they were. So Tanny's taking Liam to the church, and then we, we skip back to Ty, and he's with Father Delgado, and Father Del Delgado comes back, and he's like, are you ready to talk to me? And to poor Ty is still holding the books. <laughs> and he tells Father Delgado, I got what I wanted, but nothing is better. And then you feel so bad for him, because that's true. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, he's he's kind of saying, like, you know, everything's everything's terrible. And Father Delgado says to him, that's because you define yourself by the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And I think that's so spot on. 
from him for everybody, for Ty and Tandy. Yeah. You, what do, do you, like, what do you think? Because I was thinking, what does it mean? Because it's something that we hear a lot, like when someone says, oh, you define yourself yeah. through this. Yeah. But then I, I found myself like thinking about it, like, what does it mean to define yourself by this thing? Usually, when, when something defines you, it tells you what you are and what you aren't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, like, that's the line. That's where, that's where you end, right? So, and, uh, you know, like, that to, to have that line and then to cross it, right? Because that's what happened. Like, you get, he, he beat that. So he got over it. Right. And then he's, I think he's like, exactly that. He's like trying, Ty's trying to redefine himself or figure out what's there because he doesn't know where he is anymore or who he is anymore yeah. at this point. Or a little bit. Like maybe that's going to, to exaggerating things a little bit, but he's unsure of what to do going forward, maybe. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's lost now. He's, he, he got what he wanted, but it is nothing like he thought it would be, and now he's just lost. And he doesn't know he doesn't know who he is because, like Father Delgado said, he, he lets that tragedy define him. And when he can't use that to define himself anymore, Ty doesn't know what to do. That's really sad. <laughs> like, you, you know, I, having no identity beyond right. something that happened eight years ago, and it's a real tragedy, and it's something you... You should be happy about because you you beat it, but then right. now who what, you are. It's not what, what Billy would have wanted for him. Like Billy would never have wanted him to be ah. like that, just to throw that on top of things. But we see that <laughs> from Candy too. Like she she let her fa the identity of her father of being a hero and trying to get that vindication for him was what she had right. pulled her new found I hope and identity into. So she she put all of her eggs in that basket and then it yes. when she found out that it wasn't what she wanted, now she's lost too. And she's trying to exactly. go back to the only thing she's ever known, but now she can't anymore because she's tasted what it could be like to be not a normal person, but a happier person. Absolutely. So, it's it's kind of is it's it's kind of sadder because she sticks her head out, and then we were talking about her her character before that she like runs away and she she yeah. she hides whenever things get real, and she got real genuine and like you said like everything was this was her her new hope. It's different in the way in a way because Ty was like that's who he was for eight years. Right, he already and had for that. Tand yeah, he had that, and for Tandy, it's like. No, I'll, I'll change and I'll do this with, and she put everything into her new mission, I guess. Yeah. And then boom, it's it's it's, uh, it's not even like she failed, but yeah. suddenly her her question, the question she was asking, was wrong. Like right. the whole foundation of it is wrong. Yeah, and it Ugh. crumbled, and and it is sadder in that way when you think about it because. She was going about her life, and it wasn't a good way of going about life, certainly. And she was sad and depressed and on drugs, but she was coping in her own way. And then exactly. people, people pulled her out of that and built this up yeah. with her, and then it all came crashing down. And now she's just like, who can I even trust? I can't even trust myself. I can't trust these people who helped bring me into this situation. I'm just going to get hurt because that's what happens. I get hurt over and over again. Yep. She's lost it, but in a yep. different way, almost. Poor, uh, yeah. Oh, my heart is breaking for both. Poor Tyrandy. I know. <laughs> Awful. Um, so, Ty says to Father Delgado, so he, Ty's starting to get heated. And he's he's not having this, you know, my teacher, my priest, my, my mentor is trying to, to get in my head again. He's not having it. He says to Father Delgado, I think you live in a sacred box alone. You put yourself here so you don't have to feel anything. And don't you think that while maybe that could apply to Father Delgado, that to me applied to Tandy more than anybody else. And I wanted him to say that to Tandy because Tandy literally lives in a church. So she put herself in a sacred <laughs> oh, box yeah. 
and she lives there all right. alone. And in those scenes she's interspersing with Liam, she tells, she, you know, she brings Liam to the church for the first time, and he's like, wow, this place is big, and she's like, yeah, it's cold and lonely. So she put herself in that sacred box, and she's all alone, and she put herself there so she doesn't have to feel anything, because there's no good reason why she can't live with her mother, except that she doesn't want to deal with it. Exactly. That's that's a good read, because I don't even know how well it applies to Father Delgado at this point, yeah. but it's perfect for Tandy, yeah. Yeah, I wanted her to, like, hear that, because I, I, like, I kind of like when Ty, like, like not, not yells at her, but, like, kind of tells her how it is. Like, exactly, that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what Tandy needs to hear. <laughs> so, Father Delgado is kind of like, whoa, <laughs> what, why is Ty treating me like this? So, you know, he's kind of like going against saying there's no God and everything, and, and, and nobody, you know, he's angry, he's angry at God, and he's saying, you don't know me, and God doesn't exist, and he doesn't know me because he doesn't exist. And then he starts swinging at Father Delgado, and in that moment, I was—I think I audibly gasped when he when he swung at Father Delgado. Like yeah. that just got me. And then Father Delgado was like, "No, we're not doing this," and he kind of just grabbed him and pulled him into a headlock. <laughs> Quick reaction time for a priest. Right, kind of shows you a little something there, right? Mm -hmm. In the other scenes, we have Tandy, and she's, again, showing Liam his her church, and he makes a comment on how it's this big abandoned building, and she's like, yeah, it's it makes it even more lonely and cold. And she says to him, do you know why I want to live here? And she said that she always wanted to get married there, and that she, <laughs> he's kind of like, what are you talking about? This is not the same Tandy that I knew. And, and as an audience, you're like, right, because she grew. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but she says to him that, that she dreads those help, those hopeful dreams, but she wants to build a happy life. So you're looking at her like, oh, you got Liam out of jail because at that party you saw his hope and his hope was to be married to you. So this is like your last grasp on trying to make your old life work for you, is what I got out of this. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like it's like this scene and interspersed with what and Tyrone was doing to Father Delgado, like, both of them, it shows how good they are with manipulating and reading and controlling emotions without powers. Like, that's... Uh, and we, we've yeah. mentioned so many times that they're both smart kids. Uh, they just... They know which buttons to push yeah. regardless. And with with all the... Add to that their, their experience with... with what the fantastic things that are happening with their with their abilities, yeah. and you're like, oh man, these kids are so so dangerous because they on, on on top of what they know, they 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 have more practice with it now. They understand what makes people tick, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So T Tandy was like getting, literally getting um, Liam's hopes up, and <laughs> yeah, I guess Tyrone was playing playing with um, Father Delgado's fears. And, and then that literally happened. So when when Father Delgado yeah. grabbed Ty, Ty went into his fear, and Tandy, when she kissed Liam, went into his hope. Right. So yeah. let's talk first about um, Father Delgado's fear. That was so sad. So you see that bloody soccer ball, and then there's this kid laying there dead, and it was a car crash, and then you see Father Delgado is sitting in the, the driver's seat, and he's drinking. Mm -hmm. So that's right. something from his past, and, you know, Ty has the same reaction that we do, is like, wow. So that... Yeah, and it's it, it goes um, back to the way he described um, the fall of the hero. He specifically used... Um, when the rubber hits the road, right? When, when oh, I did not connect that. Yes. Yeah, when when t so the whole thing with tires and yeah. and and accidents and crashing crashing down and boom, here he is. And there's a reason why he he said that because he's de obviously. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's not just a fear, but also a memory, which is what we saw last episode. They can do that. Yeah. Uh, this is some. This is the thing that hopefully we'll find out more. Um, <laughs> Probably like not until next season, but whatever, whatever um, Father Delgado is running away from that Ty picked up on yeah. is related to this. Yeah. So you see that you see that fear, that sadness, 
And then on the other side of things, you see Tandy. And she looks so cute in her wedding dress. Like, <laughs> she just looks, she's so beautiful. They, they did a really good job with her and not, like, overdoing it again um, with her yeah. her fake wedding outfit. Um, but she tells Liam right before she kisses him that he was a good thing. And I think that she kind of realized that she really played him. And, again, she's really grasping at straws to, to try to bring some kind of normality back to her life. Um but she kisses him and she goes into his hope and she's seeing them, you know, they're getting married in his hope and they're, they're going through getting the communion and it looks good. And then she's going to reach over, Tandy, who's watching everything, is reaching over to Liam and she's like, I'm going to steal this. And then at that point, I kind of got mad at Tandy again because it's like, how much can you use Liam? <laughs> like, you really yeah. got into the deepest part of like, <laughs> his hope and then now you're going to take that because you are so addicted to feeling good you need that level of hope like that that's his yeah. ultimate his ultimate hope it's not just some what the guy we saw in the beginning it's not just some fantasy this is Liam's right. like dream and she needs that to to make her Absolutely. better until like with uh -huh. Like with all drug addicts, I guess, like it just gets worse and worse, and you yeah. need bigger hits. And yeah, the, it's interesting because the hope here is, I'd assume, like to be, I don't know, like a, like a, a giant hope, if, if you can say something like that, yeah. because it involves her and it's so personal. And and she's, she, there's no one else that she can hit like this, except, no, seriously, there's no one else. She could. This is the biggest hit that she can get. I, I guess maybe outside yeah. of her mother, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it has to be. And you're right. Like they did a good job of, of upping the ante with every hope that she was stealing. In that way, that yeah. a, drug, a drug addict needs continuously needs a bigger hit to get that same feeling. And the, yeah. they, wrote, they wrote that in. Wrote, they wrote that in really well to the episode to show, you know, she's getting worse and worse. She's on this downward spiral and it's it's getting so bad that she bailed Liam out of jail to steal his hope because she just to do it. Yeah. Um <laughs> it took him to the church of all places. Like she really played that up. He's a bad person. She's at this point she's <laughs> a bad is. person. She's been it's it's not okay. So then of yeah. course who's gonna save her from this downward downward spiral? but Tyrone. So Tyrone passes Absolutely. Father Delgado and he's like, okay, that's not okay, but what's this door? And he opens it up and you see the light and you're like, how is this happening? Like, in that moment, I was like, really? He can go into her memories still? So, like, we saw that before, but they still right. have that they still have that connection. So he walks into the church yeah. and Ty sees what's going on and the church is crumbling around because she's stealing all that from Liam. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and she sees him... <laughs> And it, that just shocked her that she had to stop, and she actually, like, pulled away from the kiss and broke the connection. And she turned just like we, you know, we kind of did, too, to see if he was standing in the room with her. And, of course, he wasn't. He was back with Father Delgado. But I love how they brought him into that. Her face was scary there, too. Or, sorry, not scary. Um, when she turned, like, she looked like a different person. Like, I don't know. Her, her, she can do things with her face that's, like... Uh, not just with her acting, but even her facials, like, she can, she's a chameleon, and which yeah. totally, I mean, talk about Liv, and that totally fits uh, Tandy, of course, because she's a con artist. Yeah, and I think in that moment, like, that look on her face was, like, shame, because a drug addict doesn't mm -hmm. want anybody, oh, yeah. let alone to know. somebody they, somebody they care about in any way. Yeah to see them at their worst. And that was her at right. her worst. I mean, she might as well have been putting a needle in her arm. And he walk in on her and saying, hey, what are you doing? And he saw her like that, so vulnerable. And she did not want that. And I think that that was a fearful shame look on her face. And that's so True. sad. Such a good yeah. actress. Olivia is amazing. And so is Aubrey. And they're just, they were so well put together, but... I think she needed that. She ne Obviously, she needed that wake-up. And I think that Ty, and, and I, I wrote in my notes that Ty is the only one who can save her from this. Right. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, and it, 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 Like, he just comes along at the right time. Or, right. Yeah, kind of the worst time for her, but 
but the also right the best time, time for her, yeah. right? And we've seen that yeah. with him. He's able to be in the where he needs to be. That's that's part yes, of what exactly. he can do. And he was there for for her because he saves her. Um, and that goes into another one of Father Delgado's speeches that we'll get to in just a second. But you know, Tandy wakes up from the the hope, and T Tyrone's not there, and then. Father Delgado is let go, or he, he lets go right. of Ty, and he just looks completely drained. <laughs> he and shook. he tells Ty to just leave. Yeah. And he also pointed out to him before they started fighting that he was really close to being expelled. And I was kind of uh -huh. worried about, well, it do, I guess it doesn't matter at the end of it, since we saw what happened at the end of the episode. But... Right. In in that moment, I was like, Ty, you're gonna get expelled. Like your mom is gonna come after you. <laughs> I think they're uh, yeah, but you're right. Later on, like much bigger problems to yeah. deal with for for Tyrone. Okay, so the next scene, I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna talk very briefly about it, and I'm not gonna talk about it anymore because I think that this was our biggest build up to season two that they've given us so far. Mm -hmm. in this scene. So Father Delgado's back in the classroom. And he says, Now as an audience, naturally we want to see our heroes at their best. We root for them to save us all, to pull themselves out of their downward spiral. But sometimes the allure of the downward spiral is too strong. Sometimes our heroes are too weak. When that goes down, one of two things can happen. We either witness a death of our hero, which is I think where Tandy was headed, without tie. Or we realize we've been front row to the origin of something else, the birth of a villain. And then we go to Detective O'Reilly, and she's sitting in the bar. And here's huh. what we'll point out, too. Okay, so I'm not going to say any more about that, because I don't want to know. Right. Because Kat's going to be in, in Black <laughs> Man. But I think that was a huge illusion to season two. But mm -hmm. we point out here as well the namesake of the episode, you're seeing this lumberjack making this baton. So it's a police baton, and you see police using it to beat people. And this was, like, way back in the day. But then you are taken to present day in the bar, where the baton is hanging in the bar, and it's on a plaque, and underneath it it says Backbreaker, which was the title of the episode. And you're looking at that, right. and you're like, that looks awfully like the thing that was used to kill um, Officer Fuchs. So... That is the connection I think they made there where, you know, we know that Connors had something to do with the death of Officer Fuchs, but there it is that, you know, there's the weapon that, that the style of weapon that killed him, this is connected to the police in some way. So I think that's where the title of the episode was brought in. Yeah, uh, there, uh, there's something I'll say about that uh, a little bit later. Okay. Do you want to make it? No, don't make any comments on season two. You, believe, you right. can talk about it on Twitter. Guys, feel free to message the, <laughs> our, our uh, Twitter with any of your season two predictions, and I'm going to keep my blinders on. Um, so then we go right. into O'Reilly's drunk at the bar, and you hear there's other officers there. So this is a, a bar that police are frequenting, and they're, and they're kind of, you know, like remembering Fuchs as being a really good officer. And then Connors comes in, and you're like, why is he here? And then he uh -huh. cheered. He, he, he like made a toast to him, and that just got under all of my skin. Yeah, dude. <laughs> like, oh, this guy. Dude, they wrote that so well, because that's when O'Reilly gets, you know, moves to action, and it's just the worst thing that you can say, right? Right, Ugh. yeah. So that made her so mad that she starts fighting him. And Connors is... A, jerk so he's like has no problem with fighting her right back and really just like kind of like goes all tie on her and like starts punching her in yeah. the face and you're like whoa hold on <laughs> like I did not expect him to do that it's the same moves too like yeah. um knocks the, the opponent down punches to the head and then a kick to the ribs yeah I think that's exactly what I did so yeah interesting yeah like that's an interesting huh. parallel like Ty lowered himself down to that level to Connor yeah, yeah, yeah. because Connors is like JD Oh yeah. JD Evermore is a wonderful actor and does a fantastic job of making me hate Connor so much. <laughs> Cuz he is like bottom yeah. barrel right now, you know. 
And you're like, Absolutely. and and Ty lowered himself down to that level. And and Connors is like, I'll fight anybody. I don't care if she's a woman. I'm going to punch her in the face and kick her in the ribs. And that's something that you don't see. I think you see that less and less. Like, you know, I mean, as a society, everyone's pretty much, we try not to show violence against women. Right. Uh, so when we when you do it here on, on a superhero TV show, you know, it's like, whoa. And... It was pretty explicit, and yeah. also again the size difference between between um, Connors and oh sorry yeah between Connors and 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 O'Reilly, like I actually I, I finally had enough and I just googled it like <laughs> Emma Lana is tiny man she's like five three okay in real life, uh, and and um, Connors is six one because I remember even last episode when he was talking to. When they had that big scene with Aubrey, he was yeah. bigger, taller than Aubrey even. And on top of the the size difference, the way he got the upper hand on O'Reilly was that um, number one, he got a cheap shot in, like she wasn't yeah. ready. Totally. And the reason she wasn't ready was the other cops were like holding her back. So on yeah. top of all that, you just really hate the guy. <laughs> right. But then you feel so. like, like whatever is going to evolve with her you feel like there was a reason for that. And, like, that really stuck out to me. You know, like, she's really, like, she really did what she thought was the right thing to do. She did everything she could, and now she's getting literally beat down. And he says to her, "Yeah, um, I hope it doesn't, something like, I hope it doesn't take you too much time to recover because you and me ain't finished yet. And you're like, yeah, we're, you're not, Connors, we're not finished with you either. <laughs> Oh my god, we're so, so, I'm so excited. Come up and... No. So we know, like, obviously the videotape confession <laughs> didn't do enough to keep him in jail, so he's out. Out and about. Yeah, and sorry, a lot of people were saying why the other people didn't pull him off. For me, I, I'm not sure what you how you feel about it, but for me, I feel like it's because they know he's connected, because yeah. Officer Fuchs did. I mean, Officer Fuchs knew... So I feel like everybody would know, and nobody would mess with him. So yeah, I think it's they're just that, that's terrified. That's the only reason. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, they sure. know that. I mean, obviously, they don't know what he did, but I think that, I think that they're not. They wouldn't be surprised to learn. I mean, they've got to know about the confession. They all have to know, so they they can't yeah. be surprised by that. And to see that, you know, everybody knows that he has an uncle. I wonder too. Right, right. He was there with somebody else. When he shot Billy, like he had a <laughs> the other guy. Yeah, like what happened yeah. to the other cop? Maybe that'll come in later. I don't know. Maybe he paid him off. Maybe he killed him. Keep him quiet. Who knows? True. Interesting. So maybe we'll learn more about that. Um, but then we go into so we're done there, and and you're like feeling for Detective O'Reilly, and then we're taken back to Ty, and. He's with Evita, and he's about to kind of tell her, you know, it's like she stops him and she's saying, like, you have to talk to me. I can help you. And he's like, you don't understand. And you're like, yes, she does. <laughs> she does understand. So he was kind of about to tell her, like, about the police. And then the scene we've all been waiting for happened. Yeah, here we go. And all of a sudden, Tandy shows up in her Tandy, you know, way of being able to be wherever the hell she wants to be. And she's walking up to him, and she yells at Ty, stay out of my head. And he's like, whoa, what the hell are you doing here? And then Evita, because she's a strong woman, stands in front of Ty and is like, you're not mm -hmm. going to talk to my mm -hmm. man like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it seemed like, in my head, this is how this was going to go, so I was super excited to see it, like, play out. So then Evita puts her hand on Tandy, and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> like, I was worried for a moment that they were going to start to brawl. Because, you know, everybody's brawling <laughs> in this episode. I was, like, kind of waiting for it. And Tandy looks at her like, are you really touching me? Okay, this is what we're going to do. So she touches her back, goes into her yeah. home. And then this was, like, one of the coolest scenes. And you mentioned something on Twitter about this, about how Evita has a hope of being a doctor, and I don't understand the reference. And if it's not too spoiler spoilery, go ahead and explain your Dr. Evita reference. Oh, no, it's just, uh, it's just a theory thing. Um, a lot of people... There is a famous character from the comic books named Brother Voodoo. Uh, he's like buddy-buddies with um, Doctor Strange, and 
Okay. Uh, his brother was actually in the Doctor Strange movie in a small role. But anyway, um, ever since people found out that Cloak and Dagger is happening in New Orleans and the, the, the voodoo connection, obviously people were like, oh, Brother Voodoo would be like a perfect character for this series. And um, one of the things that happened with Brother Voodoo in the comic books was he became, he became Doctor Strange for a while. Like he was the Sorcerer okay. Supreme. So I'm like, oh, Voodoo, Doctor... You know, Doctor Voodoo. Like, could this be um, like a gender swap um, introduction of, or the birth of Sister Voodoo almost? Oh, Sister Voodoo. Right? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be something. Could be nothing. Um, even even well um, acknowledged it on on one of our uh, interviews. So I guess they're. I, I guess the important thing is they're leaving it open yeah. for the future, but. Yeah, for sure we know what we're about to find out is she's not like other people. Yeah, so Tandy tries to steal her hope and Evita turns and looks at her and screams no at her. And in that moment you were like, like well, awesome. okay, Evita, yes. you can stand up to Tandy. Tandy's look, the look on her face was awesome. She was yeah. like, what? <laughs> Nobody tells me no. So then, of course, that snaps them back into reality and Evita is like, looks almost scared and she's looking at Tandy yeah. and she's like it's you and Tandy and Ty are kind of like what's going on like what are you talking about <laughs> they kind of just had this look on their face like they were confused so then Evita leaves but Tandy doesn't care because she doesn't want to deal with whatever that uh, inter that exchange was at the moment she cares more about yelling at Ty so <laughs> she's Continuing to yell at Ty, and she says, she's saying, like, hurtful things to him, like, don't, do you think we're some kind of partners, because we're not, and, um, you know, Ty is saying that his problems are worse, and she's like, I would pay to have your problems, and, you know, kind of yeah. really trying to make him feel like his problems are nothing, um, and right. really just trying to hurt him. A lot of the things she was saying to him were just really hurtful. Yeah, and, um... Sort of, and then again, one of the many, many callbacks of this episode, like uh, I, I, I can't remember exactly, but I feel like that was also that one of Tandy's like main arguments against him because they've they've they obviously have argued in the past, and mm -hmm. one of her things was you have the luxury of your problems. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so that's just one of the it continues that that uh, line, plot line, I guess, plot point. Yeah, and, and that's another regression that we're seeing from her because she had grown from that. She was willing to help him with her with his problems to like acknowledge that, yes, she's not the only person who's been hurt in life. And then in this scene, it's like you, she went right back to that, but tenfold. She's just throwing in his face, like, you're, so your brother died, whatever. You have this family and you live in this house and you go to this prep school and everything's great for you. Like, I would kill to have your problems. And it's just like, you know, that's not, the, yeah. that's not her. And... And when we first saw that, Ty was the one who pulled her out of that at that point. He's like, I know that you're not this person. You're not this, you know, completely damaged, angry, ugly person on the inside. I know there's something else in there. And at this point as an audience, we know that too. We've seen better Tandy. We've seen, you know, yes. how good Tandy can be and how loving and caring she can be. So as an audience now, we're looking at this and we're in the same position as Tyrone where we're like, this is not you. And you, no matter what she throws at him, she's he's following her. He's like, have you talked to your mom? And you're like, yeah, why didn't you like say something to your mom? And it's because she doesn't want to deal with it. And, you know, he she says to him, no, I haven't talked to her, um, but we're on the same page. She says, if you don't hurt you, if you don't hurt, you get hurt. So that's kind of like right. where her mindset is. And she goes as far as to pull a dagger on him to, <laughs> to tell him, like, leave me alone. And he doesn't even flinch. He's just staring her down like, I know you're not going to actually dagger me. And he says, I'll see you in your dreams. And then they kind of part ways. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. Like, so far, he, am I right? Like, he, we haven't seen what happens when... He actually gets hit by the, by a, a light dagger. Right. No, we haven't. And they're very they're being very smart. I think about that, like finding ways to avoid that. Like over here, 
uh, it's more like you're like, ooh, he didn't even flinch. Like that's what you notice. But actually, it's a, an interesting way to if, to avoid showing the result of that. Actually, yeah. like because from the comic books, things happen when when he gets hit. I mean, you know, like it's it's not a secret that that's the first thing you read about the characters. Like he feeds on the light daggers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I like that they're they're for people who maybe aren't too familiar with that. They're not necessarily like spoiling it but they're finding creative ways to not show it yeah and and i i like the fact that she's she gets kind of shaken up by his non-reaction yeah. and you know it's a, a good way to end this argument which is I, I, the whole thing is like a call back to to them arguing for the first time in episode three. Oh wait no episode four when they when they got into that conversation that yeah. went on too long and they started comparing problems. Same thing that happened here. They started yeah. being like, oh, my problems are worse than yours. You should hear about mine, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and and he just reiterates to her, like, I'm not going anywhere. I'll still appear in your dreams to pull you out of this. And, and he's just like rock solid and she's never had anything like that. And I think that yeah. that, that has scared her and it probably still scares her that there is somebody like that that she wants to put her trust in that she wants to count on but she's been hurt so much she's not sure how this could be but this proof I think is what she needed to see that he really is not gonna go anywhere you know she's trying everything she can do to push him away and he's like no I I will still see you in your dreams to help you absolutely and I I, and of course not to discount that and she was helping him too by pointing out True. Truth that maybe he, he was like trying to to I don't know like not face like the fact that you know this is reality you know like just because you, you it's not a video game where you you beat the final boss and things are okay like you have to maybe I don't know maybe she's trying to tell him that it'll take time or things won't go suddenly back won't get better all of a sudden like you have to yeah. work at it and yeah she was just. I think it's very important to to mention that again they're they're each other's answer Aww. to their problems. Yeah. Aww. Ty Randy. That was a good yeah, way of putting hashtag. it. Yeah. Oh no, that that's uh that's Olivia's words. <laughs> I'm just stealing I'm just stealing them. <laughs> well, that's okay. It's a it's a perfect way to put, you know, what they are to each other. Yeah. So they end that argument and they go their separate ways and then we have another classroom scene and this is the final classroom scene speech from uh, Father Delgado. So he says, by now you may be Mm -hmm. wondering what is the point of regression? Why watch our hero go through any of this? And you know, in your head you're like, yeah, why do I have to watch Mm -hmm. them go through all this pain? And he says, because the story isn't about them, it's about us. Heroes make mistakes because we do. They do things they regret because we do. And like most any story told, myth is a mirror. One we hold up to see ourselves more clearly. And that is the catch-22 of the human condition, the inability to see ourselves for who we are. And you can see that really clearly with Ty and Tandy. They can't see themselves for who they are. They see themselves for who they are through each other's eyes. Right. And then he continues, and when they do, we may not like what they see. So as we watch the rise and fall of our heroes, the question we ask should not be, will they be greater? Can they ascend? When the rubber hits the road, when the tire blows, the question we should ask is, will we be greater? Can we ascend? So I thought that was super powerful, along with the imagery that they were showing during this speech. Um, First, it was Evita carving the Tandy figure. Um, for, to go on the mantle Interesting. to tie. And then we see Ty and Tandy separately walking the streets, and we know it's Mardi Gras again because we're getting some hints of that in the background. But as Father yep. Delgado is talking about, you know, you need to hold a mirror up to see who you really are, you see Ty staring into a puddle, and you see Tandy mm-hmm. looking at her reflection in a store window. So they're kind of like taking a moment after they had their fight after everything's happened, to really kind of reflect and see where they are in those moments. And I think they have a realization, they kind of come down a little bit, and Tandy, 
you know, she's, yeah. like, I need to go apologize to Liam. I shouldn't have done that to him. And she goes right. back to the church to find him. And that's when we find that Liam finally stood up for himself and he took all of that money and left. Yeah. And it's important to remember that he had some, at least some of his hopes taken away. So he, he's not yeah, normal Liam true. either at this that's point. True. So he's, you know, just like uh, Mina killed the bee, Liam is going to hurt Tandy. Mm-hmm. So that's what she comes back to to find. We have a side story going on with Mina, and she gets a phone call from Peter Scarborough, and he's yelling at her, and she's saying, you know, don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. And she sees that they're having a pump issue at one of the pumps, and all of a sudden there's an explosion, and you see just like in Ivan Hess's memory, there's that yeah. um, that energy that comes out of the pipe and hits the workers. And just like before where they turn into what he called the terrors, they came after Mina and started, you know, running after her to try to attack her because they got infected. So that is still there eight years later. That energy is still there to infect people. Yeah. I At first I thought it was, and I thought it was like Stan from episode yeah. five, but, yeah. but she actually yells out Dan. So, uh, <laughs> There's a there's a Roxon Stan and a Roxon Dan, and I, I, I this is so cool because we we put that together a few episodes ago that what would basically happen would be uh, a zombie a zombie what do you call it like an infestation right yeah and that's that's what we're having except these are the running kind of zombies which aren't fun yeah uh, but that's how they related the whole thing to. Yeah, we were talking about it a few weeks ago. Like yeah. that's how they're gonna make it easy to understand. It's a zombie outbreak, and that's what we're gonna get. Yeah, they're called terrors, but you know, you know what, what's they're up. going. It's this murderous army of infected people, and by the way, it's Mardi Gras, so there's a whole bunch of people here. <laughs> oh yeah, because I guess episode yeah, everything that happens next week will take place in the same night, right? Yeah, Pretty much. like it's like all building up, yeah. like. You just think of Auntie, like, you know, because she knows this. She can see that this is going to happen. She knows what time of year it is. She knows that there's a major influx of people in the city. And everything is Ooh. just being catapulted towards disaster. And she's like, the only people who can stop this are the Divine Pairing. And they're kind of a hot mess right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we get, after that Mina scene, we, we go back to Detective Riley, who has a bloody nose. And, you know, you feel... You feel terrible for her, and she's about to leave the bar. And then you get um, a radio call over the police radio, and it says that they found Officer Fuchs's killer, and that they put out this huge bulletin, and we need everybody, and it's like a level four or whatever they said, and it's a huge deal. And you're like, oh, okay. They found his killer. Like, who could that possibly be? Who are they connecting this to? Because you know Connors is out, and you know he's had something to do with messing up other people's lives, so you're wondering at that point where this could go. Um, and then we're taken to Ty. And Ty, oh. this scene, oh, this scene got me. So, the, mm. Aubrey and Gloria are just so fantastic at the mm-hmm. their mother and son relationship. It's just beautiful. Um, so Ty's at home, and his mom asks him to come sit down in the kitchen. Because that's where everything goes down, like you said. <laughs> in the previous <laughs> episode, is in their kitchen. Um, and she kind of says, like, ask me what you want to ask me. And he says, why didn't you do anything? And this is the scene where we finally get an explanation for why, you know, they didn't push this. And it's because, right. and she explains, like, you have a white officer who killed a black kid, and... If what you were saying was true, it means that the police covered it up. And who's going to help? Like, nobody's going to do anything about this because you can see in this country that people don't care about this at this moment. So that was a political tie-in they brought in. But she said to him, what do you think those people who, you know, were responsible for covering this up, what do you think they're going to do to you? You're this little boy who is, you know, saying that this person, he's the eyewitness to the death of how this actually went down. What do you think they're going to do to you? And from the the parental perspective, they had to protect Ty at all costs, even if that meant 
right. not believing him because it was the only way to keep him safe. And the like all her like glorious face. She's just such mm -hmm. she, again. She's just such a good mom. Like she, you could feel that pain that she had for her kids. Like she wanted justice for her son on one hand, but she couldn't bear to lose another kid. So this is what they had to do. Right. She, <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this scene, man. I know. It it's so good, and she. There's something about the two of them that they. Well, especially with Aubrey, I think, like, he levels up <laughs> when, yeah. like, his acting skills, like, levels up when, when he's acting opposite Gloria. Yeah. Because every single time, it's it's something else. Uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, first of all, they're both, they're, they both make good points, right? Like, yeah. you can't say one is, is correct, the other one isn't, because Gloria is being a mother. She's being a realist. And you know she she's of course she's had more life experiences she she knows a little bit more of what's up and what it means and we had that um, sh short flashback of last week of um, her talking to Miles and she was saying she didn't feel safe I think something like along those lines mm -hmm. uh, about after, this is after what happened to Billy and. Yeah, this is an explanation. We know that it's not just, um, I don't know, rhetoric from her. Like, like there was a legit threat to to little young Ty's life because yeah. he was the only witness to a murder and, you know, all the political stuff and the fact that Connors is, you know, he's got strings to pull, he's connected. She had reasons to be afraid and... Obviously, those carried over. Maybe you know, of of course, that that lessens over eight years, but that explains why maybe she's distant towards Ty because she's yeah. trying to be protective of him, sort of, like just dismissing whenever he'd feel the urge to to investigate further what happened. Because obviously, like yeah, because that's what defined him. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so sad. Like some of the the, word, the lines that, and I'm sure you 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 wrote down some of the lines that they they're about to say, and it's just so so sad. And it's a great um, again another callback to their big discussion in episode one, I believe. And now we're getting a continuation of that and yeah. uh, an explanation for why why Gloria is who she is, and more importantly, why why Ty is who he is. And I think that you're, like, so spot on in saying that she's looking at it from a realist perspective. I mean, she's had more experience. She understands the political, racially charged climate, um, especially considering the situation. I mean, she points that out really clearly to him, and she has a completely valid point. And to basically say, like, you're going to go against the entire police force, and, and if you keep pushing this, they're going to make this go away. And I, I couldn't lose another kid. And and he yes. says to her, right. Ty says back to her, they could always come after me. And and he brings back the conversation that they had in episode one, I think it was, where, you know, she's he's saying, you were right. No matter, even if I do everything perfectly, you could still lose me. Because, yeah. and, and he's right. So you feel for both sides because he's absolutely exactly. right. Exactly. He was still mm -hmm. that eight-year-old kid, and they know that he saw this. So at any point in time, even if he hadn't said any other word about it, they still could have come after him. And that was Ty's yes. point. Like, if I'm in danger anyway, why shouldn't I stand up and fight for my brother? Because that's what I want to do. And, you know, she tries to say to him, you know, you have to let it go. You have to let the guilt, the regret, the fear. And she's reiterating what uh, Father Delgado was saying to him, to let it go, let it go. And he's just like, I can't do it. That's not what kind of person right. I am. And and you're kind of left, like, understanding both sides of things. Uh -huh. um, but then we don't really even get a chance to really explore the conversation because all of a sudden right. the police are are on his house and you're like oh my god they are arresting ty for the murder of officer fuchs like connor's really went the whole nine yards on this he's not playing around anymore um 
So Adina, yeah. you know, she's like, go, get out of here. You, you need to go right now. <laughs> and Ty runs. And did you see how he left his cloak there? Or did he grab it? I think it? he was... He was. He wanted to grab it, but he decided against it. Like he didn't have enough time and just ran away. And that ties into why he just didn't teleport. Because yeah. I mean, the way they established it is he, for now, he sort of needs the cloak to fully control the teleporting. Yeah. So that's why he's like just running. And um, we're gonna see next week that he he gets another another you know reminder yeah. of yeah. Of Billy to be able to do his thing. Um, one little nitpick from this scene: uh, it, it was just weird. The the guy speak the cop, I guess, presumably outside speaking on the megaphone when he's like, "You're under arrest for the murder of Officer Fuchs." Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're really gonna call him Officer Fuchs and really just tell the people like, I don't know, it's just weird. Like, you're gonna like throw that out there, yeah. It's so specific and. Somebody, I hope somebody knows his first name, you know? Right. Um, yeah, and um, what else was I going to say? The, the, oh yeah, the, okay, so I, I did not pick this, uh, pick up on this. Um, who picked up on I, I think I saw it on some Reddit thread. Oh, oh and, and um, Joe Pukaski mentioned it. The murder weapon was... A piece of okay, so the murder weapon for Officer Fuchs, which um, Detective Riley found, mm -hmm. was a lead pipe, a bloody yellow lead pipe, right? Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, it looked like I thought it was a bat too. Like I thought it was okay. uh, related to the the backbreaker thing that you mentioned. And the 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 last time we saw that was um, episode maybe six. When Ty is running away from from Connors after O'Reilly shot Dwayne, right? He was running away and he like jumps over like a yellow pipe thing on the back of wherever they were. And made in the trailer for the season ten or uh, episode ten to to point out. Connors points out he jumped over the yellow banister. Like he, okay, he, right, perfect. He so, made a, a point yeah. to, to say that. Yes, so that's the thing. Connor saw that, and he knows Ty's fingerprints are on that. So that's pretty what? interesting. Nice little Easter egg that ah. uh, totally missed. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Like that's diabolical. Connor's is Connor's yeah. is low. Wow. That dude. I just wrote that really down. I'm gonna write right. loud next to it because that really got me. I think it's, yeah. I still think that they had the baton and the backbreaker thing imagery in there to to let you know like yeah it was the police but man yeah. because I was wondering like that did get me when I was watching the trailer for the next episode he was like he was the kid who jumped over the yellow banister like and I was like why would they put that detail in there? <laughs> now it makes sense whoa right whoa okay so we're left with Ty and and I think it's funny too that they announced like you're under the arrest for the murder of Officer Fuchs, like, in reality, they would have just, like, beat his door down and not given him a warning that, like, they're all there and, like, basically gave him time to get away. Yeah, pretty kind of cheesy, like, yeah. come out with your hands up. Right, like, right, right. That's right, right. literally what they said. Right. So Ty gets away, and that's where we're left with Ty for the episode. Then we go to Tandy, if we're not already traumatized enough, and she goes to her mom. <laughs> And she says, she walks in, and she says, Mom, I know you're here because the door was open. And you're like, mm, okay. And she's saying, I want to talk. I want to talk about everything. So, again, she's taking Ty's advice because he's the only one who can tell her what to do, and she listens. You know, she wants to talk about everything. She wants to get it all out. And then you, there's gunshots, and all of a sudden, Water Girl is in her house. <laughs> Water Girl. She has Melissa. So she's holding mom, and she's saying, I'm going to kill her unless you come out. I'm going to kill her, you know, after the count of three. And Tandy's kind of standing there, and her hands are glowing, and you're, you're back at that line with Father Delgado of, like, like what makes a hero a hero is, like, what they do in these situations. And then the episode's over, and you're like, okay, <laughs> I don't even know what to do right now. Did you, did you like, because when, when I saw the... 
the water girl come out and I was like, oh shit, and you know, for like the 15th time in that episode. Yeah. So That was the like, last one. Yeah, that I mean, that episode was really just full of those oh shit moments, but I was like, man, water girl's back, and, and she said to Tandy, like, I'm gonna kill your mom, and you know, you know what I'm capable of. So it's like she knows that she saw her kill Greg. So like they're just. And actually, her. I had a problem with that. Like how? I thought the same thing. I'm like, how would she have seen him? Like she right. was in the dark, pretty far. And if she did see him, like she'd probably do something about it, or or somebody would tell her to do something about it. I mean, unless you um, know that she got the files, like she had everything. So maybe they just assumed. I don't know. Roxanne's the kind of company would let like a loose end like that go. Yeah, but I mean, or maybe Water Girl did a terrible job of burning down Greg's office because Tandy still got all of the work <laughs> out of it. Exactly. So. <laughs> so I don't know how professional she is because she, yeah, I mean, she's just she does she only have like one move like because right. we saw her earlier, right? Like she's always just bringing around. Is that like her day, legit day job? Is she like a legit? She is like a uh, fucking woman. Yeah. Water delivery girl. <laughs> uh, about the scene, I, I don't know if it was intentional, but when when Tandy comes in, she comes in and she goes straight to the uh, kitchen counter and she grabs like veg, like chopped vegetables and like starts eating. And the last time we saw that was when she was with Greg, Aww. right? That's sad. So I thought that was like a little callback to, to remind us of how dangerous um, Water Girl is. And another nitpick, I don't like that. <laughs> maybe maybe she's not as professional as, as, as uh, we're saying. Maybe that's true because she gives up Peter Scarborough's name like, like that. She certainly right? did, yeah. I mean, maybe she Tandy was didn't mean to good. ask. No. T yeah. TMI. <laughs> Well, she's a professional because she has a silencer on her gun, Butch. Didn't you notice that? That automatically makes her a professional. <laughs> yeah, and she, like, missed Tandy, even though she caught her by surprise. Uh, yeah. Missed her, like, with three shots. Um, but, yeah. I'm just excited next week for Tandy to cut a bitch. <laughs> yeah, like, what is going to happen? They really left that. And I'm like, I can't handle if some if Melissa dies because I don't want to lose her Ooh. as a character. I really don't. Ah, yes. She's she's amazing, and now we know all of this extra stuff about her, and we we have new feelings for her. And then, but that's what this show does. They make us like people, mm -hmm. and then they kill them. Yes. So I'm yes. I'm legitimately nervous for what could happen to Melissa, even though I really don't feel like they're gonna kill off Tandy's mom. I hope not. <laughs> and Adina too. I mean, Adina's surrounded by police. Yeah. So I don't how safe, how safe she is. Both of the moms are in trouble. Everybody's in trouble. That's not okay. <laughs> Literally, everybody is in trouble. All those people there from Mardi Gras don't even know what's coming. Yeah. Uh, so. I'm great episode. episode 10. So we have one more episode. And. I don't know. I'm just. I'm not ready for it. I'm really not. I'm glad that we got a week in between because I need to recover from this episode <laughs> to like really prepare for episode 10. This was intense. This was like the usual feels that they give us mm -hmm. plus a lot of like thriller action towards the end. Yes. So like a really engaging episode, I think. I agree. Yeah. Alrighty, we're going to, really quickly, I know we've been going for a long time here, but we do want to read some comments from the social media from you guys, because again, we love interacting with you guys, so please continue to tweet um, us at our Cloak and Dagger pod handle on Twitter. Um, but before we get into that, we are going to pause for a quick word from one of our sister podcasts. Hello, hello, guys. It's Ashley and Chloe from the Siren Podcast. Hey, guys. A podcast all about Freeform's new show, Siren. Siren takes the whimsical concept of mermaids and gives it a darker twist. You can watch Siren on Hulu or the free format. All of our episodes can be found on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. Follow us on social media and join the Mer family. Okay, we're back. So our comment that we got to our question of 
if you're not too shook to leave us a comment from <laughs> episode 9, let us know what you thought. And we got a great comment from um, Patrick Gamboa at Gamby004, and he said, I think this was a great episode. Everyone has their fallen moments. They were executed pretty well. And it's really right. prepped us um, for the season finale, which I totally agree with. I, I really feel like that, you know, season or uh, episode nine or episode 19 would be like the, the prep, you know, like it's going to set you up for everything that's coming in the finale. Um, and then he said, plus, who knew hope could be used as a drug? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Patrick's a smart dude. Yep. Um, and then we had a couple more comments from um, I Love Captain Marvel. And they said, I think there'd be, um, this was in response to our, the question you asked where, you know, we finally got our Tandy meeting uh, Evita scene. Um, and you asked, like, what would it be like if uh, Leah met Ty? Like, how would that go? And I love Captain Marvel said, I think there'd be some tension between the boys, more so from Liam. And yeah, I agree with that because Ty is just so mellow. Um, however, Evita yeah. and Tandy, I knew Evita was hiding something interesting. Um, and then they added, I, I just can't wait to see the tension rise between her and Tandy, especially because both of them have an obvious connection with Ty. Um, Tyrone and Tandy forever, though, and I have to agree with that. I love Evita, but I love TNT, Ty Randy. I don't know. This episode, uh -oh. like... What? I don't know. Evita was, like, so cool in this episode, uh -oh. and... Tandy hurt Mina. I don't know if I can forgive her for that. <laughs> she did hurt Mina. Oh, but you have to forgive her for that. I mean, it is really hard to forgive her. Cause she yeah, does. and the stuff with Liam. I don't know. This is the worst. That, this is as close as I'm going to get to to Tyvita. Hashtag Tyvita. Oh. This is Tandy at her worst. For sure. Yeah. But you know who stuck with Tandy at her worst? Ty. <laughs> I think I think you need to stick with Tandy first too. But no, I hope in episode ten there is some kind of re uh, resolution between Mina and Tandy and what she did to her because that really did bother me. That was, uh -huh. and I, I read a tweet from Joe Joe Pukaski that Olivia is like the least selfish person, and that having her her acting these scenes was like had to be really difficult for her because she doesn't even know how to be that. And I thought that was really sweet to, like, you know, to be such a, a support of your actors, but, like, right, just to have another confirmation that Olivia is really just a fantastic actress. I mean, we know that already, but to have somebody that you care, that you care about as a character and then they can also play them where you're mad at them, that's, that's skill. Yeah, and, and, um, Again, and and she's so good that it doesn't feel like it was hard for her. Like yeah. it's kind of, right. I don't know, she uh, kind of effortless, really. Yeah. Maybe she was talking to JD JD a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you make people hate you week after week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that theory. Um, so, any final thoughts before we wrap up and wait on episode ten? No, um, I'm just really. Sad, I guess. I, we only have one week. I'm excited for the the week. I feel like it's gonna be a big episode. Yeah. I, I I they didn't cover as much of the plot as I thought they would, honestly. So I thought like we'd we'd have the the a little bit more of the zombie outbreak for one thing. Um, That's a good point. So so yeah, we just we barely got it. So it's it's gonna be a very. Um, Heavy action episode next week. Obviously, a big finale, mm -hmm. and we're we're gonna see if if nobody mentioned it this week, but that that the prophecy about one of them dying is always in my head. And uh, yeah, and like who's closest to that? But Tandy. Right now, yeah. Yeah. For sure, and yeah, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be here next week for. I don't want to talk about that prophecy. <laughs> I can't Do you think it's going to be like, if that's the cliffhanger and we have to wait no, nine months? No, no, I <laughs> can't one, handle that. Can't this like... be like a <laughs> metaphorical death, like they have some kind of rebirth? <laughs> 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 I can't handle an actual death between the two of them. 
Or anyone. Or, any of the characters, no. right? Oh, oh God. Somebody's going to die. No, everybody. <laughs> I'm telling you someone's going to die. All of the deaths have already happened. <laughs> that has to be it. No, I, I know. Somebody probably is going to die. It, it can't be Melissa. I can't handle that. Like, Andrea Roth is just so amazing. And now we have all this, you know, in the one one little scene we have so much more information on her character and so many more directions her character oh you're right know. they're not yeah they can't do it now they can't, they can't kill her uh i'm a maybe it's oh man i'm afraid it's gonna be miles i mean otis oh no because his story is kind of done like maybe it'll we be know him. Ooh, ooh. no but he just he just stole stuff from Tandy. They have to figure... Well, yeah, they could do that. He's, like, week. not going to come back at her with a vengeance. Yeah, at some point, I feel like you have to get rid of Liam. I hope it's not the end of season one, but he's he's a complication. Okay, if, he's, <laughs> if he's the person... If we have to have a death, I'm okay with it being him. Because it'll further... it It would build Tandy, I think. To see, like... You know, maybe she'll have a moment with him where she apologizes to him for what she did. I don't know. There's, like, an opportunity for there for her to grow as a person. And, like, I I don't hate Liam like I thought I was going to. But if somebody right. has to die, he would, be the, <laughs> he would be the least... He would make me the least sad. It's going to be eventful for sure. Do you think it's going to be JD? Would they do that? Uh, not JD, I'm sorry. <laughs> Connors. Connors. I mean, it's too happy an ending, right? We right, <laughs> and we already saw that that doesn't work. Happy endings don't work. So nope. Maybe it'll be maybe like I said, maybe it'll be like a metaphorical death of like a person who then, as we heard Father Delgado, like what are the two options? Somebody dies or somebody becomes a villain. I mean, you have actual death or metaphorical death of a person, and maybe we're gonna go that way to go into season two. Maybe. Not, okay, I'm done. I'm done. On that note, <laughs> good night, everyone. I'm done. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining us again. Uh, thanks for listening to us talk for two hours about Cloak and Dagger, because obviously we're both pretty passionate about it, and we hope that you are too. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, as always, continue to follow us on Twitter, and please uh, shout out to us, talk to us. You know, We'll always read comments and everything on the episodes. So if you have anything that you'd like us to um, talk about on the next episode, the season finale episode, please let us know. Um, and you know, shout us out. If we're not following you back, make sure that we're, we're doing so. Let us know. Um, but again, thank you for joining us. And we will see you guys again next week for the series season not series season finale and we know we're getting a season two um so thank you everyone we'll see you next time bye-bye Bye, thanks for listening to this week's episode make sure you check out the show's description down below so you can follow us on social media talk to you next time